Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Folge des Laufenden Ecken Podcasts, dem österreichischen Laufpodcast, den ihr schon ganz, ganz lange hoffentlich frönt und auch immer wieder einschaltet. Und zwar jede Woche am Freitag um 9 Uhr früh. Wir haben letztes Mal schon in Vorausschau der 200. Folge euch ein Double Feature geliefert und äh, haben euch das um die Ohren geschustert und ihr habt das jetzt hoffentlich auch alles schon angehört, weil dieses Mal geht die Luzi so richtig ab. Wir habt nebenan schon ein anderes Interview und eine Folge mit Flo und mir alleine und jetzt da haben wir für euch einen ganz besonderen Leckerbissen, den wir euch sofort und ohne große Umschweife über irgendwelche Punkte und äh, Sterne und sonstige Sachen, was wir sonst das vorher sagen, einfach direkt servieren wollen. Dazu werde ich jetzt allerdings auf Englisch wechseln, weil sonst versteht er uns halt leider halt nicht. Da kann man nichts machen. Aber deswegen machen wir das jetzt auch. Und zwar wir sind ich und der andere. Servus. Servus. Und wen haben wir noch? Flo. Introduce him. Hello. Jim Wormsley. Hey guys, how's it going and uh, happy to be here. Happy to have you. Yeah. So I, th I think most runners will know, know you, but for, for those uh, two to three people that don't know you, can you give us like a short introduction and maybe why you even started running? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm an American ultra trail runner. I run for Hoka and Wahoo um, in the US. So I, based out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I started ultra trail running maybe, well, I mean, the years are adding up, I guess. But uh, 2014, 15 is when I first started. I had a background uh, in university at, uh, on the track from 2008 to 2012. So that's kind of how I grew up running and then um, kind of started life, but then discovered some trail running along the way and then started to get into that in 2014, 15. Um, and then, uh, probably started to get in more steady training and the results kind of started to come at the end of 2015 and 16. And then, uh, 2016, I signed with Hoka for a pro contract. And then, um, now it's been a, a crazy wild ride that has taken me all over the world. And, um, I've won big races in, uh, like, I guess in the U S most notably Western States, 100 mile, I've won that three times and then I've um, traveled many places and been very lucky to, to experience many things. But uh, currently, um, almost exactly one year ago, I moved from the U.S. to France um, and I'm kind of trying to chase a dream of winning Ultra Trail Mont Blanc uh, and um, discovering that uh, um, kind of European French culture and, and uh, new racing scene over here. How, how big was the culture shock in moving to France? I didn't think it would be so bad, but um, the first time living in a place uh, without speaking the language, it's been a bit more different than I had expected. But how how did you uh, go off road? Uh, because you you did uh, track and field in, in I think high school or college, and then um, you are a, a decent road runner too. When when uh, was the point you said, oh okay, uh, I don't want to run the sidewalks yeah. <laughs> in uh, I think Phoenix. <laughs> that's a yeah, that's a funny way to yeah exactly. So I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and. Uh, literally grew up just running straight roads on sidewalks next to very busy roads that are kind of, yeah, kind of terrible to run on. Um, <laughs> and the we have stoplights all over the city where I'm at, and it's all like perfectly, well, uh, 800 meters apart um, each light. And so oh. <laughs> you can do just your perfect distance based off of how many stoplights you do. It's kind of crazy, um, especially in retrospect of where I've taken running now. Um, so yeah, is, I ran is track. Phoenix, and, is, is, is Phoenix a, a kind of a, a, a board, a, a city? Yes. Which, which yeah, is, we would is say designed. a green city. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, okay. Um, because I think people, I mean maybe 1850 kind of started living there a bit. It's, it's, I mean, by European standards, it's brand new. So, um, <laughs> but everything they, is brand new by European standards. Yeah. yeah. 
And then my dad is actually from Phoenix as well. So he's seen it all, it explode. And now there's like 4 million people in the area, but it's very Western U S built. It's spread out, lots of driving, big road, uh, very car centric as opposed to a Mm -hmm. walkable city. Um, yeah, very strange actually. Um, (laughs) But I ran track in high school and college, and then um, I actually went to university at the Air Force Academy in the U.S., so I had to go into the military after university. That's kind of how you pay back free school, not really free, Um, Mm -hmm. but that was kind of the agreement that I thought was a good idea. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it it has pluses and minuses, obviously, (laughs) but (laughs) very obvious ones, too. But... um, interestingly enough it took me and i got stationed up in montana and montana i was kind of maybe i was 22 or so 23 and i thought my running career was done like i was too old i didn't make it i i didn't have an opportunity i wasn't fast enough to go like chase uh olympic standards or times or anything like that i think at 22 i walked away from the track like i guess the first time i broke 14 minutes in the 5k was in 2010 but um, by the time I left in 2012, I, my PR was 1352, so I didn't really knock a whole lot off of it there. And I think there's interesting like mental plateaus on the track and doing the exact same course uh, with the stopwatch that now in retrospect, when you compare it to the trail and just the freedom of never comparing anything because the conditions are always so changing, you can't miss, like it's each its own performance. It, feels like it's unlocked a lot of my potential running wise mentally with how trail running works compared to how the track I felt like I plateaued for a while um but I thought my running career was done in 2012-13 and when I was in the military so but I was up in Montana and um it's a really great outdoors kind of area place and for discovery and adventure and um, have big mountains, big winter, first time living in like true winter. I had lived in Colorado for four years, but um, Montana, I think, operates a lot more European-esque with uh, more revolving hobbies with the seasons, um, mm-hmm. where in Phoenix, it's either we say it's spring or summer. There's nothing <laughs> in between, like okay. it's sunny 330 days out of the year something. So you don't pick up many water sports or winter sports growing up there. Um, and so I started kind of discovering like some hiking and then realized, well, I could just run this and do three hikes instead of one hike today. And Mm -hmm. so I kind of started running some of them like, oh, people actually do this for a little bit of the sport. Like people in Montana are weird, but I guess I could get into this. (laughs) And then I started doing uh, some short trail races and I thought like, oh yeah, the short trail races should be where like the best runners are racing in like this event that has three different distances. So I'd go do the short trail race and i just i'd smash it but then i'd be like man i didn't get a race the guys i wanted to race like why are they in the longer one like this makes no sense to me and basically <laughs> in the track i almost think i mean the 100 meters kind of the top of the pyramid where the biggest stars are going to be usain bolts on the 100 yeah. meter line and for the most part it almost you can kind of theoretically trickle it down from there and as you're slower and slower you have to run further and further and it's almost <laughs> punishment to have to run the 10k um but obviously at an olympic level everybody's like extremely fast and uh, the competition is quite good but um i guess I, I was never that level so i was just kind of more or less the slower kid to some degree and then uh get into trail running thinking like oh i'm a fast kid now i'm gonna be in the short race and then you realize all right all the fast guys do the long races and um yeah and then that kind of opened the door into uh i guess i got uh i I left the military and just had to figure out what i want to do with life um it kind of ended abruptly um uh and i had to figure out i guess the three choices i kind of had was uh put a job resume together and apply for jobs, um, put a, like a resume together to apply for more school or, um, go move to a mountain town and get a job at a bike shop or running shop. And I chose the default and I got a job at a bike shop in Flagstaff and kind of moved back there and was just like, I'm going to 
I, I kind of committed to myself that running was making me happy. It was a really good outlet for me and that I was going to try trail running until I was 30. Um, so that would be like the next five years of this is what I wanted to take some time in my life to do for me. Um, and then little did I know, um, after six months, one year of kind of putting more time into it, it, it eventually became my, my job. And then I stepped away from the bike shop and, uh, kind of the more I put into it, the more I got out of it. And it's just been, it's given me a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard that, that you, um, you, you, you did your, your uh, decision to go the, the sport way <laughs> and, and go to, a, uh, and you worked at a, at a bike shop, uh, in Flagstaff. Yeah. And w everyone who, who looks to, to America, uh, and to the US, And who is running there and who is running fast there? There is a, a bunch of uh, fast runners coming out of Flagstaff. Is there a kind of a. Um, do you met there or everybody uh, moved there to run? Or, or is it just something in the water? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, I guess Flagstaff kind of became famous because there was a very famous coach. Um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, they kind of set up a pre, um, Olympic altitude camp for marathon runners, uh, oh. Jack Daniels. And so in oh, the early I, 2000s, I know Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah, maybe that Jack Daniels, I don't know. Not, 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 different not, one. Oh. <laughs> But, um, he was a bit of a guru and an altitude, like nut, and he kind of just, I, I would say at least from my knowledge and where it comes from him plus the university there has always been historically good. Mm -hmm. So, um, combination it's really grown to be, um, a big Mecca for marathoners and road runners. And then there was actually the current Western States champion, Rob Carr, or he had won it two years in a row. He was based out of Flagstaff. So you start connecting the dots, you go, ah, it might be okay. And then a big draw for me personally was, um, so originally from Phoenix, when I moved away from Mon Montana, actually, I moved back with my parents for three months, I think, um, maybe a little less. And I started looking for places to move up to Flagstaff from there. And it's only two, two and a half hour drive from mm -hmm. where my parents live. But my parents live in a desert, almost uh, maybe two, 300 meters altitude. Whereas uh, Flagstaff, I was living at 2,200 meters. So you change climate, you change uh, everything. And it's kind of, it has all these really nice dirt roads through just uh, very pretty ponderosa pine trees. Um, mm -hmm. So just a stereotypical forest. And it's just kind of grown and grown and grown. And then I move there, I get a bit of success. So, it, and then... I start connecting with some people that I became friends with. And then we had our little running group um, that was training a lot and they have some success. So then all of a sudden it builds and builds and it kind of becomes more of a known uh, hotspot. And, but it's been a cumulative thing of everybody wanting to get up at altitude. And if you look at it in the U.S., it's so far south. Um, the weather is really mild for how high of elevation we are mm -hmm. um, because we still get snow that we still have a ski resort, but um, all things considered you, the winter is very mild for over 2000 meters. Plus um, you can always drive 30, 40 minutes and basically there's never snow that low. So um, there's always somewhere to keep training and then track runners even like it for uh, sleeping high and then they'll drive a lot and they'll drive down to Sedona and Cottonwood and uh, do workouts at lower yeah. altitude. So, so, so yeah, in, in that way, you're very familiar to move places where you're, where that f best fits your training in, in, in to, to best support your training or to best support your races. Was that also like the decision to, to move to France? Because I mean, in the US, you basically won Western City three times, and it, there was like, it was like a big thing back then because you claimed you that you can win that in a certain time or whatnot. And now you have the same thing with UTMP. In a way, you want to be the, I suppose, the first American American to win that. So was that like also like the same decision to come to France to actually train where the the fast people train that win UTMP? Yeah, I mean, um, 
A bit. I mean, that obviously <laughs> played a factor. It it helps. Like UTMB is in Chamonix. It's it goes through three countries, but true and true, it's a French race. It's ran by a French organization. The rules are very French and <laughs> everything with it. So um, that was a big deciding factor. However, um, I mean, the, without a doubt, the biggest thing was being kind of over the years connecting with Francois Dain and then him just going, hey, I found this rental house just up the street from me. Uh, would you maybe this could work? And then looking at a place to jump from the U.S. to France and not speaking good enough French at the time, it was really, really challenging to find a place to live, especially like really in the mountains as opposed to in a city. So um, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I'm living pretty much next door to Francois on the same hillside. And uh, <laughs> just, um, yeah, but I mean, if you're going to mimic anyone for UTMB, I mean... Still, I, I think Francois has it so well dialed and his approach to it and his kind of endurance throughout the event. Um, I would say Killian's probably more talented as far as how he's been able to apply it, but true dedication to ultra, I, I still think Francois is the best <laughs> That's what I want to say. Runner. The other option would be to move to Norway, but I mean, yeah. that's maybe a little bit... But a guy from the desert, maybe it's a little too far. But now that I've been in France, maybe I can imagine Norway a bit. And maybe in 10 more years, Norway is quite warm. So, so who knows? That's the first step. Ah. First train like Francois Den, then train like Kilian, and then you can really <laughs> win UTMP like five times or so. And then, uh, it's and you, and you, and, then. And then you all move to Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they have the current uh, Tour de France champion right now. Yeah. <laughs> Denmark's not so bad. Yeah. He's, he's, he's amazing at high altitude, big mountains, yeah. and he's from Denmark. Mm. <laughs> Maybe we're onto something. Mm. Yeah. But in the meantime, I mean, you, you also do run the, the World Championship. Um, first and obvious question, why is, is it, why, why, why run the World Champions? Yeah, so, I mean, first, you, I think you kind of look at the, the year and you try to put together a schedule and For me, last year and this year, it was working backwards from the date that UTMB is. So you look at that and you try to see maybe what's two months before it is your, your first real big push. And then two months before that, because I like maybe two races to lead into my primary goal. Um, that's generally how I've approached Western States and it's kind of worked out well. Mm -hmm. However, I've also very much been obvious that <laughs> UTMB is not Western States in many, many ways. But um, I still like the idea of having a really big training block to prepare for something quite a bit earlier than UTMB. So you're not coming into just a brand new fresh block and it's your first race in August. Like that's not so good. So um, two races really jumped out. I mean, one race I've always wanted to do is Lavaredo at the end of June. Mm -hmm. um, always running Western States. It always conflicts with Lavaredo. And I mean, the Italian Dolomites, I haven't spent... I actually, I got to stay there one or two nights on the way to Croatia earlier this year, but for the most part, I have not explored it, and it seems like one of the, the gems of the world. But, I, can, um, I, I ran it once, like, five or six years ago, Lavaredo, and I can say it's, it's, it's one of the most beautiful races I ever run. Yeah, so another reason to <laughs> check out that area. Yeah. If you run uh, Lavaredo, I think you should take your photo uh, camera with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It might. I'll take a small one. Yeah, a small one. <laughs> But I mean, the GoPros these days, are that, they're not that big. So, I mean. Yeah, I can just put it on my head yes. too. Yeah. <laughs> Or you have that, like, uh, that this Insta360. You can even put it on the shirt and you would even yeah. notice. Yeah, not bad. And when you already have to carry six kilograms of backpack, uh, it's not so much. Never mind. Yeah. But so that was one. It's still on my bucket list of kind of races to do. Um, but then even discovering a couple of races here, the profiles become pretty interesting. So just being in France, I've discovered more about the, the maxi race, which is at the end of this month. And then... Mm -hmm. um, Uh, Marathon du Mont Blanc, uh, the 90K, also seems really intriguing. But it worked out that the World Championships were also in June, so that became part of the factor. And then they announced the course pretty early. Um, so I started digging into kind of the course profile, and the more I looked at it, the more I'm like, this looks really badass. It's got big climbs. It's got a ton of vert. I think they completely... 
are sandbagging people and they underestimated the amount of vert that's actually on the course. Because when you upload the GPX, I haven't been able to replicate 5,500 meters. It's always over 6,000. I'm like, oh, they're sandbagging us. Like, <laughs> for, for Americans, it's very typical European to, oh, sorry. But maybe not so German. Like, oh, we missed the numbers a little bit. But uh, <laughs> it looks really interesting um, course profile. Um, and then it's additionally like, two or three weeks more time mm -hmm. than Lavaredo would be. And I think if you look at some of the people that have done Lavaredo UTMB, it's been that kind of weird turnaround. And I've experienced it with Western States where um, when you're coming back from the, the race at the end of June and you have eight weeks exactly, you start training and you're, you start finding the best fitness all season and you're, everything's going phenomenal, maybe six weeks out, but then it just drags on another week or two. And then additionally in the past, traveling from the U S to, um, Europe, it, it, uh, essentially, um, you, the time zone change, I, it's just, things didn't fall into place on race day. So it's always been a bit weird. So in the past, when I've kind of looked at other people trying to do Lavaredo on the turnaround, it seems like it's just energy wise. It's a little tight. It's you either want it a little more or a little less because people have done really well with four week turnaround, which is pretty interesting. Um, especially the hard rock UTMB double. Many people yeah. have replicated that now and it's, yeah. it's quite interesting. And you can't, you've kind of find that groove in the energy and the fitness about four weeks after a hundred miles. So even experimenting with some bigger efforts four weeks after a hundred miles, I've started to do the last couple of years. And yeah, it's interesting when you, you find a so, good. So, so good hard rock and, and UTMB are, 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 are four weeks apart from each other. About four or, or four. six. Yeah. It's something okay. that's just pe people. I mean, Francois gotten it. Yeah. Uh, Killian, uh, Courtney, Courtney yeah. um, Xavier Tevignard's had really good success with the double. Um, mm -hmm. I guess not yeah. many people in the world have ever done hard rock. Only a couple of people get in every year, but nonetheless, the people that do the double, it's, it's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, other than that, it's, it's still a world championship. Was it also like a factor that, that you could become world champion at trail running, which is, I think if you compare it to like a UTMP is not as important, maybe nowadays, but maybe in the future, but was it also like some that drew you in a little bit? It's interesting because, yeah, when you try to find, like, define the world championship in our sport, um, it doesn't really have a neat place that everybody respects as, like, the world championship. There are a lot of people missing at this world championship. I mean, even amongst Americans, um, most of the top Americans will be doing Western States, not trying to be on the world championship team. So it's always kind of got this, how does it fit in? Um, I think at least from my observation last year or yeah, last year I think was the first time that the world trail championships was held at the same time as the world trail or world mountain running yep, championships. Yep, yep. So yes. I think consolidating these races, it gave it a lot more attention in a bigger microphone that at least was observable from my perspective. And this will be the second time. And then, um, so I think that's a really big step in trying to make it a world championship. Um, be just making it more visible and more important essentially, yeah. because when it's more visible, more important, it becomes more prestigious. And if it's more, then it will hold the name. But I think in years past, it just hadn't quite held that prestige, but you'd, because even with the world championships five, 10 years ago, you'd see a world championship every weekend is what it felt like. And you're like, I don't even know what these mean, but at least yeah. consolidating it on the same week. Um, I think it was a very, very important um, yeah. step forward. And I think without adding an ultra distance, you're not going to, you're going to um, leave out a huge part of the sport because again, like my introduction to trail running was the first thing was like, no one cares about the short distance. Like you need to move up. Yeah. That's not the case. Like the true classic distance mountain running stuff is quite organized. It's quite historic. You go back Sierra's and Al Zagama, um, some of these races, they're, they have incredible depth and history to them that is very interesting. But I think as an American kid, you don't get the opportunity to go do those things. So there's a disconnect of like our biggest things are going to be more like 100 mile or 50 mile races. Um, so 
that's kind of where I started learning um, what to shoot for. And I think even from a um, um, from a um, people watching, it's it's also different to differentiate between mountain running and and ultra trail running. It's still running. It's still running up and down mountains. I mean, they nowadays they still have uh, different rules. Um, how how each country nominates their the athlete, so it's still a little bit not completely like integrated. Um, yeah, and it's, but it, it, I think it's a start. Different, and then there are different uh, organizations because we we learned that the the trail running championship uh, came out of the ultra running uh, championship, which was on 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 road. And the mountain running was always the mountain running, like the, they had a, a vertical or a, a uphill and an up and down. And now they are different organizations, but at least they are in one week and it's one one thing. And and this this from from short uh, uh, uphill, uh, uh, let's say a vertical to the to the ultra uh, distance, I think it it. Uh, Uh, it yeah, it, it makes a, a bigger microphone, and you have the the middle yeah. distance. Maybe it has to yeah to to shape a bit like the. Well, it's the, still a marathon uh, distance, which yeah, is quite like, appealing. Like, like uh, maybe then it's 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 also good for for people who run at the uh, Golden Trail World Series. These yeah. these the 30, 40 k uh, ish races. So everybody has his uh, his focus, but yeah, but, uh, it's good and bad. If you want everyone to do the same, but at the same time, um, I don't have as much interest to do a 12k trail mountain race. Yeah, yeah, and then I find the vertical course kind of interesting. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on it? Because it starts with almost a flat kilometer. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 uh, we we talked to the to the organizator uh, uh, organizational crew, and they said uh, the the first kilometer they they um, do this because they wanted it to start in the city. So yeah. so there is a lot of uh, there's a big crowd and it's 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 a uh, fun for everybody to to see the, the the runners go out there and then it's uh, you gotta hike up the hill and go yeah. bring the cowbells up to the top of the hill. <laughs> they don't have to to hike. There is always uh, some some cabin <laughs> up <Yeah>. there. <laughs> it's not the spirit though. <laughs> but I think but I think what 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 in, in a way what they want to replicate is a little bit of a UTMP feeling. But if if you start at UTMP and you run out of Chamonix. I mean, it's I, I I I got to experience it once, and it's it's crazy how I mean I was I was in the last quarter or something, and it's crazy how the people cheer you on, and and you're basically nobody, and to 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 of of sorts replicate that, that's I think where they wanted to start in the in the in the center of Innsbruck and then um, move up to the mountain as fast as possible. Yeah, I I think that's an important part of also going back to choosing the world championships as a race is. So you look at the timing, the timing works out very nicely if you're peaking later for another race at the UTMB series, mm -hmm. whether it's OCC, CCC, or UTMB. Um, so essentially you work backwards from that, boom, perfect timing. And then secondly, um, it's easy to get to at Innsbruck. Plus yeah. it's, so being European based, I think um, it's going to be really, really competitive. I mean, worst case scenario now it's a, It's 10 hours from the US or it's 10 hours from Africa or I don't know how far it is from China or Japan. Um, yeah, but there are uh, direct flights to Austria and uh, yeah. there is a there's an airport in Innsbruck I mean, <laughs> in the city. I think there's, there's a big reason that, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion, many really great developed sports are kind of European based. And um, I think maybe me moving here is a bit of a realization that... Uh, A lot of the events that I want to be racing um, are are favorable to be based in Europe and not traveling back and forth for many reasons. But but from a from an American perspective, what do you think we need to happen other than maybe scheduling and not um, colliding with with the Western states to get the World Championship up and and make it more important so that. Maybe people would would choose it other uh, instead of Western States or something else. Yeah, um, 
to, to make it a, I, a real world championship. To make it a real world so like like I mean, you say, we still Wimbledon. have a good team, um, and there are even some good runners that aren't doing Western states, and they're not doing the world championship still that aren't racing it from the U.S. But the U.S. is one country. I think we still have a really good team starting off with me zach miller and drew um holman and and then we have a couple other guys that could potentially score um but i think that's a really strong three just to begin um yeah it's interesting um how you yeah it's, it's always been a little bit of a trick within the u.s how to kind of draw the best runners to go do the world championships and more or less it hasn't worked because the draw to go do Western States UTMB or a different championship um, ends up being uh, bigger prestigious for your career than than a world championship. But last year it kind of worked uh, with timing being at the end of the year. Um, but I guess for me personally, um, I was actually stuck in France and for yeah. visa issues. And <laughs> yeah. we're actually hoping to have that completely finally resolved tomorrow. But uh, we'll see. That, 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 does it need to? Uh, locate one time in the US the championship that it's uh, it's more get, gets more I media I think having it based in uh, Europe is much better than having it based in the US the US you could host it there and I wouldn't be surprised if there's just a couple people you, you won't ever have that UTMB um, atmosphere and a lot of it or you won't have the aesthetic course Okay, what you're able to do um, on a course like run it and the amount of people you're allowed to run on the mountains in europe is just not allowed in the u.s they say oh this is forbidden it's it's never going to be the same if we run 500 people on this course today it will yeah. it will be gone forever the mountain will go away so um they don't allow it and then right. but in europe they do it all the time and then in addition you have so many cities that are bigger populations that are close to mountains and essentially You also don't have people that mind hiking or maybe taking a cable car or at least waking up early to go catch some yeah. some climb. You you just get hundreds of more people going to do that as opposed to in the US. It, you definitely get super fans and there's really great supporters, but the atmosphere is not replicated in the US the same way it is in Europe. And I think most places in the world, I mean Europeans are they love sport, they love fans and they love go cheering on something that's ridiculous like trail ultra running no no that uh, is, is is this the, the the main difference between the us and, and europe when it comes to 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 trail running uh, uh how you how you um how you see is from how how the races are set up how the people race is there a difference mm -hmm. even uh in the in the way uh the organizers <laughs> do this or yeah you would there's, do this. i mean there's a lot to unpack on the differences <laughs> um there, there's a lot of differences uh some of the basic differences i find are firstly being that um many of the races in the u.s are permitted through the national forest that the u.s has so numbers are limited so that's why you see only 165 runners at hard rock you, you see only 160 or 365 at western states They go through these wildernesses and these protected zones that they don't allow more people. But it tends to be all the really cool places are protected that you can't host permitted races through. Mm -hmm. Like you can't do a race through the Grand Canyon. It won't happen. So it just ends up being a FKT, fastest known time sort of thing, as opposed to an organized race. I mean, a race on the Grand Canyon would be pretty insane. It's it's an incredible stadium for something like that. But no. uh, yeah, for I mean, actually, a dangerous place too. But then, so. but then you race across the Grand Canyon and then you're stuck behind a donkey. I mean, that would also be very <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Uh, in a race, you might kind of shuffle past. They might not be so happy, but uh, a race scenario, yeah, you, you might shuffle past. Um, but yeah, you'll probably get stuck <laughs> behind some. Uh, they're mules, not donkeys. They're, they're a hybrid between uh, donkeys and horses. Yeah, and, and, and in the UK, you're stuck behind the sheep. So where's the difference? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, in Beauforton, where I'm living now, you can get stuck behind many different types of animals. <laughs> but we, we mostly have cows and goats. Um, and lots of fences to go like a little electric fences where they're starting to put them back up because the cows are moving up Valley towards <laughs> us again. Um, but actually one of the fundamental differences that I see 
actually across the world is just temperature related. Warmer countries, I think, tend to run more runnable races with less equ- equipment. And plus, European stuff, again, tends to be more in the mountains, a little more rugged, a little colder. And when you get caught in the mountains, you can really get caught in cold weather. So that's where I think ingrained has become the mandatory gears. So in the U.S., most of the races you can do with handhelds and fill up with water and boom, boom, boom. It's, it, it makes for a faster-paced thing. And even a difference between U.S. men's running and U.S. women's running, um, the men's running tends to be just a little quicker at least. Like, I, I mean, Courtney's... <laughs> She's right there. But for the most part, generally speaking, um, the men are running a bit faster. And I think you can kind of get away with a bit less gear going lighter. And it's risky. But at the same time, you're, you're trying to go for full speed. But the courses aren't as hard. They're not as technical for the most part. That we, we don't host as many races on the East Coast in the U.S. And the same thing, like, why can't you get more people to... But, people are almost looking at it's a track background you're looking at the watch you're looking at your speed and you're like oh i'm not going fast enough and the more and more trail you do the more mountain you do you need forget it it doesn't matter like are you dropping the guy behind you all right good keep going <laughs> like you're going fast enough um and sometimes that's extremely slow if you look at your watch but you know your heart rate's over 180 you're, you're, you're past threshold. You shouldn't be there because you're in the middle of a hundred mile race, but you're making the move and you're dropping everybody. Like you're going fine enough. Uh, is, is there a, a big difference between runnable in the U S and runnable in, in, in Europe? <laughs> because uh, when you come uh, to trail run into ultra trail in, in Europe, everybody says, Oh yeah, it's runnable. It is. Okay. Try to run this runnable course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, so even like in the Bouverton, um where I'm living, um, the trails are runnable. If I go for just a 15K run, yeah. I can hammer it. But now you want to add, instead of just 1,000 meters, you try to do two, 3,000 meters. Well, what was a run, I mean, essentially, it's the same thing about UTMP. It's a yeah. wide open highway if you look at the trail. But at the same time, like the amount of elevation gain, we're all human. It breaks you down. And guess what? It breaks you down. And guess what? You're an ultra runner just like everyone else in the starting line. You're all broken. It doesn't matter how much you trained before this. Um, it's really rewarding to kind of push through that and discover like the ultra of you're moving forward, you're surviving, and you're kind of scrapping w your way to the finish line. Um, UTMB has definitely uh, pulled that out of me every single time I've done it. So whereas Western States, it's the same distance. It's incredibly hot. It's extremely difficult. However... I've ran that race and finished it a couple times and I could have kept going for another 50K. I felt just incredible and I was running at the end of it. I have not ran like that <laughs> at the end of UTMB. So, I mean, for the most part, it's really broken me down. And <laughs> Why? It's, it's, it's only at of, the end. <laughs> yeah, it's very, if you finish a little bit. Um, but overall, I think it also yeah. goes to kind of stretching your your um, plasticity and elasticity as a runner to your perspective of what is long. And I've been working on more just the perception of what is long. Like, um, And you need to – so in the U.S., you look a lot at distances. Europe, it gets hard enough where I think you have to think time-wise. And mm -hmm. when you're thinking about time – and it's even training philosophy. Most runners in Europe are basing off of meters climbed or time outside. Most runners U.S. based are logging miles and they're looking at 100 mile weeks, which in Europe, 100 miles is like, wow, that's 160, 170K. And you go like, yeah, it's 100 miles. It's standard in American like university trek running. Like that's what you have to hit. But then, um, uh, yeah, I have friends here that are like, oh, I'm over 100 kilometers this week. And then you put it in miles and you're like, you're at 60 miles this week? Like, come on, man, you can run. Like you need uh, more volume than that. But it, it just goes to you getting fixated on these numbers. And in reality, it's kind of learning the process to slow down, be out there for time, and um, kind of endure um, a little longer. Yeah. But it's, 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 uh, it often looks as if you are approaching a, a goal from the side of the impossible. So, so may, maybe f because you're f uh, coming from the US, you're fixed on numbers or on, on trying to, to hammer it from the first meter. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, it, it from the, from the outset it, it looks like you're not 
aiming for the win, you're aiming for the course record or to, to destroy the course. So uh, I don't want to win the UTMB. I want the first to win it below whatsoever. Or I, I want to... to uh, well, uh, here, wait. <laughs> here's one thing how I combat this. So it goes to, okay, you're racing UTMB. Yeah. What's your strategy against Killian? What's your strategy against Francois? Like, that's my first dilemma. Every UTMB I've lined up has been against one of them. I've never had a lucky year not against one of them. So you there is no lucky me, year. Like, how you beat them at UTMB. <laughs> that, that's maybe a, a tough comp competition to have. That's, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, so does it mean, I've been on the losing end of that one. Does, does, it, does, does it now you put the UTMB uh, uh, to a... To a to something like like Wimbledon or or something like that that you say okay when I'm running there and I I'm in the in the top pack there that that are the the world best uh, runners every year the, 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 if you look the top 10 uh, on every year it's insane or you're just waiting for Killian and Francois Day to not, not not to not attend so that they finally have your chance to win it <laughs> I, I mean, I think if you keep showing up, you'll eventually get lucky. But um, I think ultimately the way the sport has developed, it's so different than it was 10 years ago. There's so many other races to do. And I think um, win or lose this year, I, I really want to approach this race healthy um, mindset wise, I guess, and how I'm looking at it, how I'm approaching it. Hopefully mm. I'm in a mindset that 24 hours isn't so long, that it's doable. I can conquer this. Um, which five, six years ago, you look at, I look at 24 hours running through the night. I'm like, oh man, that sounds really like this is a problem. But now I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, it's not so bad. I'm becoming more of a fan of some of maybe the backyard ultras or some of the two, like 300 kilometer races or some of these things. And I'm learning more and more about the sport and you go, ah, you know, UTMB is not the longest, it's not so bad out there. And then I've had more experiences running through an entire night and I'm even throwing some of that into my training and it changes perspective a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think the learning process has been there. Like UTMB has kind of been the carrot at the end of it, but it's it's been more about changing my, my own perspective of the sport rather than just no. UTMB being the thing. Like I think that's not necessarily healthy to fixate on like success being measured whether i win it but at the same time yes it's obviously a driving factor i obviously want that but at this point i feel extremely like gratified of how much i've grown away from the track runner mentality and into just someone that can go survive in a really hard course on a really hard day or a couple of days maybe um and that's where i've wanted to gravitate towards for myself as an athlete but then i guess now bring it a little full circle this is where i've kind of tried to build that direction as myself as an athlete and especially towards moving out here to france and working on it before i got out here but now the world championships you look at it it's 86k it's got more vert per kilometer than utmb yeah. does <clears throat> and i'm looking at the course going oh this looks like it's really within my wheelhouse and um, I, yeah, I'm extremely excited about Innsbruck. So, so you're basically <clears throat> planning, you're coming to win it. So it's, 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 even if it's like a preparation race for UTMP, you, you're not there to, to have like a, a faster training run. No, I'm trying to, so the one, one debate though, it also goes, okay, how much do you want to challenge yourself <clears throat> on the course? How much do I want to hammer? And yeah. really, like, try to just get the most pure, best performance of myself I can. Or do I go, okay, it's a world championship. The goal is to be podium. The goal is to win, run a bit more tactical, wait, wait, wait. And I feel like I've been racing a lot more world races like that. Um, I mean, I can say I sat back more at uh, Ultra Trail Cape Town, Madeira, um, and Istria most recently. I, I, I heard from Istria, from, from Florian Grasl. <laughs> he said, well, on the, the first kilometers, you, you, you were in the pack with them, and then the first time it goes up, and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually broke my pole maybe 20, 30 minutes into the race. Oh. So I was like, oh, I broke my pole. I might as well just run this. Like, um, uh, uh, 
Oh man, Arthur was up above me, but I didn't realize Arthur started just hammering and he got a huge gap. I'm like, oh man, I'm lucky that I started closing this because if I tried to close this gap in the middle of the race, it would have felt like he was forever ahead of me because uh, it was very early and he wasn't very far ahead and it still surprised me how long it took to catch him. But it started with just breaking my pole. I was going to be patient, patient. But once I caught up to Arthur, again, it just went to sitting back and and <clears throat> not wanting to push. And I felt like um, I wanted to wait through 100, uh, yeah, 100 kilometers in the race. We we kind of reached a big aid station there, and kind of judge how I was feeling. Um, and we got there, and it was still dark. And at first, I was thinking I didn't want to run much of the course by myself in the dark. It's always nice to have a bit of a partner through the night. But um, I could kind of sense he was having a little bit of a low patch and then just kind of uh, I couldn't hold back and kind of <laughs> pounced on the moment. But but then you got to go, OK, you got 60K. You got to go send it now. And like, all right, here we go. So um, but it, it went pretty well after that. And I mean, I was able to switch my pulls out at the next aid station. So um, the rest is history, I guess. And and it was a, a very smart move, I think, that that you you did Istria that that uh, early in the year. Because so you you are in UTMB and ha not have to 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 uh, yeah. be nervous in June or whatsoever uh, yeah. w when everybody tries to to get these last uh, things because they they, they did this uh, no, only the first three and the second chance and whatsoever it's it's really complicated now. Yeah, I think everyone's a little frustrated with the new rule changes with UTMB and then even after Istria they've even changed it more so and i think i'm not even sure i would have had to race but nonetheless i but, just wanted to i'm describing it as um they they only allowed top three from utmb last year to come back the, i was fourth place so i was the first one out that way i didn't have another qualifier so they're like oh sorry you gotta race in i was like <laughs> all right i'm gonna race in i'm gonna get an entry they make you pay 400 whatever euros to get in and I'm not uh I don't owe you any favors when I show up to UTMB this year like you you didn't help me out at all to get there in the years past they give you a bib they they get you in and I think they had an amazing um entry for elite athletes to get into UTMB and that's kind of what's created the event for the atmosphere for all these elites to show up is kind of the encouragement of how easy it was to be an elite runner to get into the race yeah but a lot of that changed this year and they really want you to as an elite to do one of their other races no matter what and so yeah they want to, to promote the other races i think the, that, the entire series yeah, so yeah, yeah. um so essentially there's frustrations with beginning that uh, they, they they run and own a lot of amazing races throughout the the world so i mean it's not so bad but yeah it's becoming a bigger system that's a little frustrating to to be There's good and bad to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously, UTMB is still UTMB. It's quite an amazing event and an amazing race. Um, I mean, you get to to run a circle around the the tallest mountain in Europe. It's pretty cool. Yeah, but we we have a lot of of of, of uh, awesome mountains here, even in Innsbruck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one one question I have uh, about the the weather is there a, a nemesis? for you like you're a yeah. pro runner okay so you you run all the year but it's wind or heat or rain or snow or maybe creaky noises off the poles i don't know <laughs> um so i found that i think i get colder at night than i really realize um and one thing i've started doing in the last year is if it's going to be a colder night run I just start wearing tights. Uh, I know I'm good at the heat. If I get hot, I'm okay with that. But if I get cold, I, f I have found that I get into some trouble sometimes. So, um, I mean, a simple thing for me is I've started just racing in full tights a lot more um, and keeping my legs covered a bit. I found my when my kneecaps get cold, um, I, I don't like running so much. With I, I lose some of the sensation in my legs to kind of feel the hill and how hard I'm actually impacting the ground when my knees get a bit cold. So just keeping them a little warmer has really, really made a big difference in the last year. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I once had a funny story, but Tim Tollefson said that, um, I think it was like two or three years ago, I don't know, the last time he went 
the third at UTMP, he, he went by um, Dylan Bowman because earlier at the race, Tim Tollefson put on his gloves way earlier than and, and, and he could eat because his hands were still warm yeah. and Dylan Bowman didn't and his hands got cold and he couldn't eat anymore because his hands were so cold that he, he couldn't move them. And it's, it is those little things that make or break your race. That's, that's, that's yeah. funny. And again, it's all uh, Tim Tolson lives at very high altitude in a colder place in uh, the US and Dylan Bowman lives in a little more mild climate and could be a little bit um, a difference of kind of where they're living and used to running in a bit colder weather. That 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 uh, uh, high altitude training it's 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 cool if you 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 learned it or you you are used to it from from Flagstaff, uh, and European runners are used to mountain running and 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 more technical parts in in the mountains. Yeah. Is is that something you think you can or, or, or not, not not just you uh, somebody who hasn't learned it in the in the childhood can learn it uh, like somebody who grew up in the mountains? Or is that something yeah. you say, okay, if you haven't learned it till 15, it's gone? So it's interesting because I think um, I'm not from the mountains. I'm very much, uh, again, from Phoenix desert. Grew up first running on sidewalks. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that, in my opinion, is interesting, when I look at, more technical sports, uh, whether it's cycling, mountain biking, um, and especially what I'm learning through a bit as I've moved to Aresh is um, ski mountaineering. And you kind of look at the way these guys ski, how they go uphill, how they go downhill. There's absolutely no way I'll be, I'll be able to make up the, the skill difference on skis, uh, the way that they can ski, especially downhill, uphill. Well, I'm doing okay this this last winter, but I mean, if you look at my technique compared to Remy Bonet, I I look like I'm all over the place, and then Remy just looks smooth, 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 and it's like ah, if I moved like that, I would be just as fast. But I do not move like that on skis, and I feel like I'm sliding and slipping instead of uh, gliding up the hill. Um, Don't put that over the top because we had a uh, Christine Berglund. Uh, in here and she's tried uh, skiing and every time she tries skiing she she breaks her bones <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> stay at trail running yeah 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 so i mean i've been very no no so this winter i did um months of ski mountaineering um where we are we get too much snow you can't yeah. run all year so it's very interesting to me the true mountain athletes that stay in the mountains all year round they have to change sports Because it's not, po I mean, unless you start running on a treadmill inside, but yeah, it, come on, go outside. It, everyone <laughs> enjoys going outside a lot more. So um, essentially you start looking at the more technical stuff. I think there's many of those sports that you, you're you very, very far behind. Whereas with running, it's interesting. We all grow up running on something we all grew up using our feet we we have more of a feel in a sense with our feet as humans that isn't like skis it's not like a bicycle yeah. I, so in my opinion there's and and i've seen it how like when i first got into trail running you hear oh man the europeans they go downhill so fast and i remember one of my first races in spain uh, i got invited to do this small race uh and I was just thinking in my head, like, oh, man, Europeans, like, I better get a lead and I better bomb it down this hill as fast as I can go because they're going to catch me. And I realized, like, I put more time onto them in the descent because I was running so scared. And the more I've been in the sport of and, – and some people still have the, the feel for running downhill. I'm Luckily, I've been able to convert from track to – to downhill and trail technical trail running like fairly well i consider myself like it not really a weak point in yeah, my running okay. but many people that do transition don't transition as successfully which i i haven't understood um completely because i don't relate it it just kind of clicked when i started doing it but i i mean i don't have anything in my childhood that um would have said that i could do technical trail running apart from like I grew up playing soccer, football uh, sort of thing. So there's some footwork with that, but not really uh, exactly doing that or 
definitely not in the mountains. So for me, I think just being human, um, comparing in the mountains with running, it's it's not quite the same argument as a more technical sport. Mm. But in the end, it's also like about switching off your brain and just uh, go, <laughs> going down and, and kind of feel it. It, yeah. it. it can also be kind of a natural thing, thing that you're kind of born with or that you're that you're just good at because at least you, for me I, i i can't turn off my brain when i when i run down here so i'm you, a very bad when you look so. at the 12k mountain race i think it's very much that case yeah i i mean i i think they have to go so fast downhill that you're looking at some of those people but even when you get to the 42k if you're really going down that fast unless it's a downhill descent finish I mean, you can run so fast downhill that you you can probably run too fast downhill that it becomes such a problem later because the impact forces, like cumulative, are so bad later in the race that more more times than not, it's not a full send in a race. It, it's and, and you're in the zone, so it could be extremely fast. You could smash the Strava segment. You could do faster than anyone did, but there's such a focus sometimes in races that it, it's not out of control. It's okay. But I would also say I'm not in the side of the sport that's in the 12 K uphill, downhill yeah. running for your life the entire time. Um, UTMB is a little more chill. In, in the end it's, it's controlled falling. And if, if you look at like, yeah. uh, I mean, the extreme end would be Mount Marathon in, in Alaska where we did the, the, the 5 K yeah. where they run two and a half K up and then two and a half K down. I mean, that's crazy. That's the way they run, yeah. they run that down. I, I want saw the, the video like from, from Killian, the way he runs down, it, it's bonkers. I, 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 can't. I will say that um, one thing I have picked up, I guess, maybe a couple years ago, but um, the degree slopes that skiers and downhill mountain bikers that they see and that they can read the terrain, their vision is a little different. And it becomes, they don't feel out of control. They don't look at the slope, as 40 degree slope and go, whoa. They look at the 40 degree slope of like, ah, oh, I've skied steeper than that. That's fine. Let's go down it. And yep. essentially their vision's a bit different, I think. Um, and that's an advantage going yep. very, very fast downhill. But that, that is a, the difference between uh, Florian and me because I, I grew up with skiing fast. And so maybe that's that, that's the advantage, uh, because he played tennis and I go work <laughs> on skis. <laughs> uh, but uh, there we maybe I should run downwards with my hands or something. Then, yeah. I'm, then oh. I'm maybe a little bit faster. And and you we heard try and come back. <laughs> and and we we heard that uh, that up and down uh, stuff. Uh, even from mountain runners from from Austria, they said uh, the normal mountain running uh, guys and and girls. Uh, It's more like a, a dust road up and down. It's not technical at all. And they don't want to do trail because trail is so technical. Even a, yeah, a, a highway like, like UTMB yeah. is, is more technical than the usual mountain running thing. So, so they say, okay, when I'm, when I'm coming from the road or I, I, I come from mountain running, I want to, to have this, this, uh, normal street. It goes up or down, and it's, it's it's not technical. Yeah, I have a couple loops, especially um, early season, late season, where I'm living. That uh, there'll be windy roads up, and then windy roads down, and um, more or less they they don't get as technical. And especially if I'm trying to do some faster pace running, um, like this morning, I was a bit time crunched, and uh, half the route was on uh, forest road instead of true trail but yeah. i need to get to get some kilometers in. <laughs> and and maybe at, at the end to bring it a little bit full circle um now if you if you would be at the world championships and you, you were like i don't know 50 k's in and and you were like in the lead would you then hammer down and go for the win and mm -hmm. maybe maybe red line a little bit more than you wanted or would you Uh, stick with the guys and yeah. wait it out. So, I mean, I guess as I read the course, there's a, what, a 1,200 foot or 1,200 meter climb, 1,200 meter descent, then 1,500 meter climb, then a bunch of high alpine ridge, then a yeah. big descent into Innsbruck. And then you got an additional 1,000 meters up, 1,000 meters to finish, pretty much. But so strategically speaking i mean everything in the first up down on the 1200 the little loop you do it's irrelevant um you can kind of just destroy your race there uh and for the most part you don't want anyone to get away but you want to stay relaxed then i think the real like 
positioning will be on the the next long climb. Then I think I mean I'm I've been training up where we are. Uh, Two thousand four hundred meters is not reachable right now. So part of me is half expecting a reroute. Um, unless you guys are getting more rain than what we're warmer rain and more rain than what we're getting. I mean. There's more snow. We arrived to France about this time last year, and maybe last year it could have worked, but I think this year, at least where we are, 2,400 meters is not going to be clear. I don't know what it's like in Innsbruck. Um, from what I hear a couple weeks ago, there was definitely a lot of snow. But yes, there's a lot of snow uh, now, uh, I heard. So last weekend there was snow up there, and they just could, could do the, the, I think, half of the route. Yeah, uh, so, Eva Sperger is is there, and some uh, from from Germany I mean, and Austria and so and they. <laughs> and they so you either run it as is or you reroute it. And one, yeah. if you run it as is, snow, super slow, really tiring to go through. The whole race will come back together. Yeah. So okay. then it will restart once you get down out of the snow. That would be very very interesting. <laughs> But uh, more than likely, it would get rerouted below it, I think. But then you're also potentially taking out some of the technical. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea. That one's theoretical. It seems extreme. Hopefully, the snow melts enough to, to run the trails. But then you have, a, I would say, a very strategic point where you could bomb down early. I would say if you're less secure about waiting till the last climb, I mean, without a doubt, the, the move of the day would be to break it on the last thousand meter climb so you're in the innsbruck already and you yeah. got your one little up down i mean i would say that's the most strategic because for the most part most people will have broken by then and if you still have something by then you can you can make the final dagger if you're savvy enough you could be you could i mean i think killian's like this killian would just wait till the last descent and you can just bomb the last descent <laughs> into town but for the most part i always flinch first and I would rather make it a long, hard race from the beginning um, for the entire thing. So I would be looking at maybe um, somewhere on the ridge. It, it depends with what runners you're with. Sometimes, I mean, other American runners might not be as strong uh, technically. So if you're trying to gap them for uh, the, the win of the race, so a technical portion could be good if you're With a European that has more of a road background, you probably don't want to wait till necessarily the descent because if they turn it off and just let it go, they'll be fast. So, yeah, um, yeah sometimes it depends on who exactly you're with. Yeah. Uh, um, do you uh, go to Innsbruck before just to check the, the, the course out? Yeah. Or? yeah? It's, um, so initially, a couple months ago, I, I had it on my calendar as I, I would go. It's about a nine-hour drive or... Yeah. Uh, about nine hour train i think too but to get from we are to just the train to begin the train um is kind of a pain um so it turned into looking up the more i kind of studied the course a bit the more i kind of realized like this looks like the beauforton kind of profile it looks mu very much like the gradients on the course i can easily get 30 40 percent the steepest stuff we'll see on the course i can easily get that out my back door where i'm already living mm -hmm. Plus, I know people, especially the French team, seem to be studying the course a lot, and they've already been yeah. there. And uh, yeah, I don't know, very serious. The, the Swiss But, team, the French team, uh, it, it's it's near from for for the Italians too, and the German yeah. team. So it's 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 right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it's it's part of why I think it's a very nice world championship. Um, but many of them have ran into the same problem that when you try to scout some of the higher parts of the course, uh, it's too early. I mean, it's really yeah. going to open up one, two weeks before the race, if it does open up. So you patient, patient. Um, I'm curious, uh, have you guys had a pretty rainy weather? Yeah, the last, uh, I Come think, the last, two the last or last three week weeks is, 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 is really rainy. And uh, I don't know where the, where the, uh, how low the snow arms. comes. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but the, I the think more I look at Innsbruck, the more I'm like, yeah. it's exactly where I'm already living. So I... Yeah. It just became, it didn't make as much sense. Um, coming back from Istria, uh, the recovery, running 100 miles, that's the earliest I've ran 100 miles in the season. So, um, and it's an eight week turnaround between those two races, which is again an interesting um, turnaround. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, it's been good so far. And um, we've had rainy weather here, but I also think 
there's something in my gut coming from Phoenix that June is the beginning of summer and uh, it could be a very hot race as well. Um, I don't know. Yep. I just trust I, I don't trust the uh, weather and I always think. Yes, it's, it's, it's funny because la last year, um, uh, Uh, not yeah l last yeah last year uh innsbruck uh had to recourse because uh on the pacha cover uh, near innsbruck uh, there was too much snow and uh a few weeks later in june uh in in salzburg i think what's two 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 hours away uh we had 32 degrees uh celsius it's it's, it's it was crazy <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think June's an interesting time. Um, it's hard yeah. to predict what the weather's actually going to be like. But if it is warm, especially for me being European based and all the Europeans, it will be the first warm weekend, warm race that any of us do. And I think we'll all get um, yeah. kind of roughed up by it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think especially this year, it's 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 cold very long. I mean, yeah. I, I yeah. can remember at the same time last year. Um, it was it was way hotter than than this year, so that's that that's yeah. that's There's definitely a factor. Yeah, yeah. Right. and 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 June is a good uh, a good month that it, there are no of uh, uh, thunderstorms and 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 so okay. because uh, July August uh, the the, yeah. the weather on the, on the mountains is it's not uh, good predictable and June is a is a good month for that stuff. Yeah, it's it's runner friendly. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Flo, do you yes, have any, uh, anything? No, I have nothing on my digital note block anymore. Thank you that we have taken so much of your time. Yeah, um, sorry about kind of the fiasco <laughs> of everything today. It's, uh, no, nobody will notice once I do my magic. So, so awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Thanks for doing uh, one of your few podcasts in English. Uh, um, thanks we for were, making the exception yeah, for me. We, we and, were kind uh, of very yeah. nervous. Yeah, we were kind of very nervous because I mean, we, you you can hear uh, that we are German, uh, not speaking English fluently. Yeah. So it's a no, Aust uh, Austrian English. Austrian English. <laughs> <laughs> the Austrian we, <laughs> your your English is amazing and extremely <laughs> easy to speak with and understand. Um, when we go to German area, first time it will be my first time to Austria. But um, when we've been to Germany, it's uh, it's always been incredible how welcoming and Because I speak no German, so um, well, I mean, you're used around. to the, you're used to to, to, friend, to the French people, so nothing can shock you anymore. <laughs> They're not as open about uh, speaking English to us, and then yeah. where we live, um, when people find out where we live, they go, "Oh, like where's the nearest English speaking person to you?" Like it could be 50k. <laughs> I mean, we're quite tucked away, but. Um, I'm excited, and uh, when we come out to Innsbruck, I'll be staying yeah. a little outside of the city to uh, maybe keep it a little more similar to yeah. Beauforten, and hopefully there's some good cows out there to oh, uh, yeah. listen to. <laughs> so that you feel like like home. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'll better. I always say, even El Bandi said it's wrong to be French, so I mean... <laughs> just, just, okay. just putting it out there. Oh, yeah. I'm still American so far. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm, I'm right now. I'm debating uh, potentially coming out a couple days earlier just to see more of the course. Um, yeah. And I might be racing uh, earlier than the trail championships while I'm out there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we hope we, we see you in Innsbruck. Uh, we will be there the, the whole week. Awesome. Uh, and. Uh, we, yeah, will be an awesome uh, uh, <laughs> championship, and I hope that's the, the the last statement. I hope when I'm the, the CCC and you are competing in the UTMB, please don't 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 overtake me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that be. is only goal. Yeah, and there's no guarantee. I say much when at that point in the race, uh, but. I hope at least if we have an interaction that uh, I'm coherent enough to recognize you and I can say keep going or or maybe you'll have a you'll you'll finish just before me and you'll have a cold beer for me by the time I finish. Ah, oh, okay. That's a deal. You, you had you had him with cold beer, so yeah, I wait with the cold beer <laughs> yeah, from yeah. the uh, uh, Mont Blanc brasserie. It's a very good ah, beer. Bring a German beer. The, the German okay. and the Belgian beer is a lot better than okay. the French beer. <laughs> <laughs> It's on. And we have a deal. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Right. And Thanks, guys. Then. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. We'll see you out there.